We are in the final week of BYU spring ball. And what are the prospects for BYU going into the Big 12 this fall? Well, there are some position groups, I believe, coming out of spring that are quite strong. Other ones I'm quite skeptical of. We'll dig into those. And we'll also get to know BYU tight ends coach Kevin Gilbride. You are Locked On Cougars, your daily podcast on the BYU Cougars. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, everybody? I'm Jake Hatch, your host here on Locked On Cougars, your resident BYU insider. Thank you for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. Appreciate all of you who are everydayers with us right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. The motto is your team every day. And as such, this is your original daily podcast. Focus on all things BYU sports. And we are brought to you today by our friends over at FanDuel. Uh, check out FanDuel today. Make every moment more with FanDuel. New customers join today and get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 wins. Visit FanDuel dot com slash locked on to get started today. All right, let's dive right in on today's show. And as I mentioned in the open, BYU is in the final week of spring ball here. And having been out to practice as often as I have and having had conversations with our practice insiders, getting intel on how things look for BYU coming out of spring, I've got a feeling uh, for, I think, a couple, some of these position groups that BYU had question marks coming into spring camp uh, about. Some of them, I think, have absolutely answered the questions about them, while others have very much questions that remain to be answered heading into the summer and obviously heading into the season now 158 days away, crazily enough, uh, here on a Tuesday. But looking forward to having football back in our lives. And let's start off with this. Uh, there's a position group that I believe the number of you, and I threw this out on social media as well as I uh, threw it out to our Locked On Cougars Insider group about what position groups you guys are most concerned about. One of them that I think I, it was getting mentioned, I, I saw it multiple times both on social media as well as amongst our insiders, our insider group, I should say, was that the offensive line is a massive question mark. Now, the O line's an interesting one because I believe BYU's got some very, very talented offensive linemen, led by Connor Pay, obviously. He's a fan favorite, a friend of this podcast. I think Braden Kime is a capable guy. I also think that uh, based on everything I'm hearing about Caleb Etienne, as I mentioned on yesterday's podcast, for those of you who are everydayers, uh, Caleb Etienne has made some very, very good strides this spring. And that should uh, bolster confidence in this BYU offensive line as well as some of the young talent in that group. I'm not as concerned about BYU's offensive line because I do expect them to hit the transport portal to try and find at least one or two guys uh, for that O-line unit to bolster that. But at the same time, with the work that TJ Woods has been doing based on everything I have heard and or seen, I believe that BYU's offensive line is going to be adequate, if not a strength, after it was a severe weakness last year. I think that coaching change alone is enough to get that offensive line unit uh, back in working order. My two position groups that I am most concerned about right now, we'll get to the ones I'm most confident in here in a moment. The two I'm concerned about the most, uh, number one, quarterback. Now, the reason why I'm con concerned about quarterback is for one simple reason quarterbacks have an outsized impact on successful football teams. Uh, the, I guess the success or failure of any football team rests more on the shoulders of a quarterback than any other position on the football field. Yes, there are 22 guys on the field at any given time participating in a given play, but quarterbacks, the ability to handle the ball on every single play give or take a handful if you have some wildcat packages, uh, their ability to impact the winning or losing margin for you as a football program is an outsized role. BYU and Kalani Satake said it last Friday when he talked to us at the BYU alumni game, he said that we may have uh, some idea of how things look at our quarterback position by the end of next week, but he said, I'm not going to make any declarations until then at the very earliest. And even then, uh, speaking for me personally, Jake here, uh, I don't think that BYU is going to make any declaration of who's BYU's number one quarterback going into the summer. I think it'll continue to be a two horse derby between Jake Retzloff and Gary Bohannon. I am still leaning towards Jake Retzloff being the guy who ultimately will win this job with Bohannon being the insurance policy, as it were, for the BYU Cougars. But they need to get steady quarterback play out of this unit. If they don't, you're looking at a team that could sink to two, three. Four wins if quarterback play is not up to snuff for BYU this season. I don't think it's I don't think it's crazy to say that that one position could sink or swim 
uh, BYU season. That's probably the wrong analogy to use, but regardless, they need to have quarterback play that is going to help them uh, versus hurt them. And right now, I'm not 100% certain that BYU has an adequate answer there. Is there still time for that to come through? And obviously, for a guy like Jake Ratzloff and or Gary Bohannon to go out there and light the world on fire and make us all proud uh, as Cougar fans? Sure, that is absolutely a, a possibility, but I'm still got major question marks about BYU's uh, quarterback room. Flipping over to the defense, my other major concern for BYU right now is at the cornerback position. So quarterback and cornerback. I believe the cornerback position has got some very, very good talent, led by Jacob Robinson. Jacob Robinson could challenge for all Big 12 honors this season. He is that good of a player, that much of an impact player for this BYU defense. The question mark remains who else is available at cornerback along Alongside him, Maury Bomb has participated in a, in a few practices this spring, but has been held out uh, due to a large portion of it. I, and I don't know what the exact reasoning is. But we've not seen him out there a lot. Marcus McKenzie is still dealing with an injury that cost him the back half of last season. He has not been able to participate in spring. Mark Collins, the transfer in from Weber State, that uh, Jay Hill believes in wholeheartedly, he has been a very, um, I guess, hit or miss in terms of his ability to participate in spring drills as well. So the big question I've got for BYU at cornerback is a who is going to stop start opposite a guy like Jacob Robinson because I think you can put in pen Jacob Robinson is one of BYU's starting corners who's going to start opposite of him and then where is the depth at that position as well. Guys like Evan Johnson, Zion Allen have been stepping up. A Trey Alexander, the true freshman coming in uh, from Georgia. They have all gotten extensive reps this spring due to the injuries of guy due to the injuries to guys ahead of them on the depth chart. And that is obviously going to benefit them down the road as they get those extra reps and get an extra look and show what they're capable of to these coaches, speaking of Gennaro Guilford and Jay Hill in particular. But I'm just not 100% convinced that BYU has the adequate depth they need at cornerback. And even more importantly, who's going to play that nickelback role? The nickelback in this defense for Jay Hill, it's a bit of a spot duty role. You're not always on the field. You're not always called upon on every single play. But when you need them, you need a guy who can go in there and be a, that quote-unquote third cornerback and cover an inside receiver, maybe a bigger a tight end, and their ability to uh, defend that position is very critical. And I just don't know that BYU has the answer at that position just because of the overall depth at the cornerback position. So I believe that BYU will be looking at the offensive line in the transfer portal. Uh, everything we've heard about the quarterback position on offense is that BYU is going to stick with what they have. And that's Jake Retzloff and or Gary Bohannon with Trayson Borgay, uh, Cade Fennigan, Ryder Burton, et cetera, competing for those backup minutes. But then at cornerback, I believe that is a position group that has emerged as one that BYU may absolutely uh, need to look at the transfer portal to see if they can find a guy coming up in the mid part of, of April when the portal opens up to find a guy or two that potentially could come in and challenge for minutes, if not a starting job for BYU, simply uh, just because you don't have uh, healthy guys right now that you can uh, to say that guy's going to be available. That guy's going to be available. The, the question mark is around the health of BYU's cornerbacks. It's not necessarily about the overall talent base. I think it's more about the depth and the overall availability. We always say it on this podcast. The best ability is availability, and right now BYU's got a major question mark at cornerback. Now, uh, just real quick on the off on the uh, uh, two position groups, I'm actually quite confident in right now. I'm actually very, very confident in BYU's wide receivers. Uh, a lot of people out there and a lot of the, the messaging and what we've been uh, talking about here is that Chase Roberts is just showing out in spring ball. Folks, Darius Lassiter is a name that I think I have failed to mention more often than I should have. He looks like he's transformed himself, and he was very good last year. Remember, Darius Lassiter had a very, very good season last year, but everything I have seen in spring slash heard from multiple people, and I'm talking different people I'm talking to, they have mentioned the name Darius Lassiter time and again about a guy that we should be talking about more often and a guy we should be focusing on as a potential number one option for BYU at wide receiver. They truly believe that Lassiter could have his best season in a collegiate uniform this year for BYU if all goes well. But the nice part is, with Chase Roberts, Keelan Marion, Cody Epps, on down the list, Parker Kingston, JoJo Phillips, whoever ends up as BYU's quarterback is going to have a full array and complement of weapons on the outside of that uh, offense at wide receiver to throw the ball to. That is a big help for whoever wins that quarterback job, and that should uh, provide some confidence for Gary Bohannon and or Jake Retzloff uh, when they're at, playing in that position. Those wide receivers are doing work, but 
Darius Lassiter, folks, get to know his name, get to know his game, and expect that he is going to have an outsized role for BYU this year if everything continues to kind of roll along the path it is for him. Because once again, he has been a guy that I've been told time and again, Jake, you need to talk more about Darius Lassiter. He is that good of a football player. He's really come into his own, so keep an eye on that. The other one I'm confident in right now for BYU as I'm actually quite confident in BYU at linebacker. Now, Ben Bywater's not participated in spring ball, and obviously you're hoping to have him back this season. But when you have Jack Kelly back there, a resurgent Isaiah Glasker, you go down the list to Ace Kafusi, uh, Micah Kafusi, uh, just the, the list of linebackers BYU has is a number of guys who are uh, going to be very, I think, capable football players who simply may be down the depth chart at the three spot in terms of the overall depth depth chart, but they're capable players. That's how talented I think this linebacking core is for BYU. Now, did that bear out last year? Hmm, TBD, because you had guys uh, like Max Tooley, you had A.J. Vaughn, but you also had Ben Bywater before he suffered that season-ending shoulder injury, who were standout seniors who have been in this program for years, quite literally, uh, in the case of a guy like Max Tooley that led the way the young talent is going to get a chance this year to prove itself. And what I've seen from BYU at linebacker, I will include Harrison Taggart in that conversation. Uh, but the, the addition of Jack Kelly, as well as the holdovers at that linebacker position for BYU, I believe this year, the linebacker group for BYU, while it may not have the same experience factor that was going for it last year, I actually think this linebacking core is more capable of having impact type play just across the board than last year's unit did. And I'm telling you, Max Tooley, Ben Bywater, and AJ Vongpachan, they offered quite a bit of that. But I really think the young talent is going to shine through at that linebacker position. And by extension, it will help out a relatively young and inexperienced defensive line by holding up the, the front seven, maybe making some extra plays the defensive line may otherwise have missed out on. So some interesting thoughts across the board. And I think a number of you have e echoed similar sentiments. Uh, Danny Drew, uh, Danny said this, honestly, I'm not confident in any position. I can understand that, Danny. I can understand why. Why you'd be uh, saying, I'm not sure what BYU is ultimately going to do because they just weren't great down the stretch last year. Brandon Holt says, I'm most confident in our linebackers. Having an experienced guy like Ben Bywater's back plus Jack Kelly uh, looks the part. I absolutely agree with that. Nick uh, Nick Hex says this, uh, offense, I'm most confident in the receivers. Like I already said, least quarterback. Defense, most linebackers, least cornerbacks. Nick is right there with me. Nick, wow, you and I are of the same mind on this. Dirk Palmer, most confident in the defensive backs. I will give you Dirk the safeties I'm confident in. Cornerbacks, not so much, especially if the defensive line can get pressure and get sacked. That's a good point, Dirk. If the defensive line can take the pressure off the back end of that defense, that's a positive thing. Uh, John Solomon, I'm most confident in linebackers, at least confident in the offensive line. The linebacker room is both deep and talented, and the O-line group, uh, oh, geez, I just I clicked on the wrong thing. The O-line group just needs to prove that what it was last year's scheme and not the players overall. And like I said, I think TJ Woods will offer that to BYU. So thank you for all the feedback. We'll continue to these questions uh, throughout the offseason and get you guys' feedback on the show. And obviously be sure to give you guys shout-outs along the way. But uh, let me know. If you guys have uh, position groups you think are underrated or are going to be ones that are going to be the, the, the make-or-break type unit for BYU, I'd love to hear from you guys. Who do you have and who do you think the players inside those uh, position groups are that are going to lead the way? Uh, I would love to hear your feedback and let me know if I'm up in the night with my evaluation of where I think BYU is the strongest and uh, I guess where I'm the least confident about BYU heading into the summer as we wrap up spring ball here. All right, coming up here in just a minute, going to catch up with BYU tight ends coach Kevin Gilbride. I've been sitting on this interview for quite some time. It's actually like a week and a half old, but it still was a really, really fun uh, getting to know you for BYU. BYU new, BYU's new tight ends coach, a guy who brings a wealth of knowledge and experience at the NFL level, and he'll explain why he decided to drop down from the NFL level and come coach in college. And let's just put it this way. There are very few places he would have done this uh, in terms of leaving the NFL for the college game. He'll explain why right here on Locked on Cougars. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel is letting you bet on every game of the tourney, my friends. Whether you're into betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on a number, America's number one sports book with our friends at FanDuel today. The best part is right now, new customers, you get $200. You heard that right. $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's $200 bucks used on points, spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all after we get to the Sweet 16 this weekend. Obviously, there's a lot of chalk going on with those brackets. So no matter what you're confident in or if you just 
feel like you have the right uh, feeling about a certain matchup, head to FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college troops until they cut down the nets. Once again, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on college. Today's show is also brought to you by our friends over at eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. Let's bring home the winning trophy is also what bring, keeps your ride or die alive, my friends. All of us rely on our vehicles, and that's where eBay Motors comes in. You got everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for with eBay Guaranteed Fit. Your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time, or you get your money back. Because, because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts that you need, the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win with our friends at eBay Motors. So keep your ride or die alive today at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply and eBay Guarantee Fit is only available to U.S. customers. But get started today once again at ebaymotors.com. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first listen today. Are you sick of watching Fox Sports and ESPN all day and hearing all of the shouting going on and having to turn on the volume to feel like you can even watch the television? Make the switch to Locked On Sports today. It's a free 24-7 sports streaming program uh, with you with coverage every day of your favorite leagues and teams. All the big stories without all the screaming going on on the other networks. Locked On Sports today brings you everything you can in terms of miss, can't miss analysis, opinions, news, and it's all streaming 24-7 on YouTube or on Amazon Fire TV channel channels and their app as well. It's a great, great product, my friend, especially when it comes to March Madness. You have these team-specific content. It's been a really fun way to keep up to date on everything going on uh, with the big dance. It's all part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where, of course, it is your team every day. All right, I had a chance uh, recently to catch up with BYU tight ends coach uh, Kevin Gilbride, a guy that I have been intrigued by since the day that BYU hired him. He seemingly came out of nowhere, but with his connections to BYU, having originally committed and played a year uh, for Lavelle Edwards in the late 90s before transferring to Hawaii as a quarterback, uh, he's a guy who's familiar with BYU and has got a lot more connections to this program that you may very well know and will allow him to explain right now, right here on Locked on Cougars. Coach, just want to start off, uh, what's it like being back in Provo? It's been good. Um, I've enjoyed for a number of reasons, but the people that I'm working with are tremendous. So like uh, guys that I've played with and then the guys that I've met that are on staff yeah. that I didn't necessarily know beforehand are great. Good people, they care about ball and they're smart. So they're fun to be around. And then my position group's tremendous as well as far as their work ethic and what they're trying to get done. They're challenging themselves, which I'm challenging them, and then they're embracing it and not turning anything away, turning it down, putting their bodies in challenging, difficult positions, and even failing at times, um, because they know that if they continue to do that, they'll grow. And that's it's been fun to be a part of that. Now, this is a position group that's been dominated the last four years by Isaac Rex. I know you didn't coach Isaac, but what do you feel like the opportunity is for all of these guys in your room to go out there and kind of establish themselves after his departure? They all have an opportunity, you know, and it's it's about putting the best, the player in to maximize what he can do mm -hmm. and then also to be able to challenge the defense and, and have multiple guys on the field at, at one time um, threatens them. They don't they don't like it when you can run and still throw the ball down the field when you have multiple tight ends on the field. So there's a lot of opportunity out there for our guys. Are you pushing for 13 personnel at some point? 13, 14, as many as we can get. Okay, no, fair sure. enough. <laughs> Coach Pessy wouldn't enjoy that. <laughs> He'd probably have, have something to say. Yeah, sure. yeah. I wanted to ask you about Keanu Hill, obviously, he making the transition to tight end. How is it going from your perspective? It's He's right where he should be. And what I mean by that is he's growing every day, getting better every day. He's a bright kid, number one. And number two, he really works at it hard. So he's developing right where he should be at this point. Last time I want to ask you about Reiner. He's a guy that people have been excited to see, four-star yeah. freshman, all that stuff. But we've seen him on the field out here. How's he go, How's he doing so He's far? doing great. He's, it's a really challenging situation for him because he didn't have the base of knowledge of the offense that all the other tight ends have. So he's kind of being thrown into the fire. So the mistakes happen, but they're going to happen. He, but rather than him going in the tank and being upset, he doesn't because I, we're encouraging him. Like, Reiner, we understand how challenging this is. Yeah. He just lets his body flow, and, and when he does that, he really can take it over, take over a game. And you've seen that just by watching some of the practices. Very explosive player. So he's got to continue to grow, but he will. Jackson Bauer, similar situation. He came in last year. I think a lot of people were looking forward to seeing him on the field. He didn't yeah. see much time. How has he looked so far in the He's looked good. Again, they're, they're all, they've all had their mistakes, but they're all working very hard to improve daily. So they're all doing a nice job. 
Now, you're one of the rare guys. You hear all the storylines about these coaches escaping college football and going <laughs> right, to the NFL. Right. You're going in reverse here. <laughs> Correct. W- what's it been like? It's been good. It's <laughs> it's. There's a lot more, a lot more different jobs in college that you have to, you know, master. And so I'm still working. Like like I say, my my guys are working to improve. I'm working to improve at all those other jobs. What what's the biggest difference in your mind being an NFL coach versus a college coach? Is it recruiting? Like what 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 is the main difference? Recruiting, making sure that your players are doing well in, in school and, and being good citizens. You know, uh, I'd say that's those are the biggest things to be honest with you that are different. The football is not that different. Right, so you think the football side of it, the actual just nuts and bolts of X's and O's is just about the same? It, I mean, some things are slightly different, sure. but for the most part, yes. Um, the biggest thing is, is the development of the guys, whatever level you're at, and being able to maximize what they can do and then minimize their, their deficiencies. Now, you mentioned that you, you were teammates with a lot of these guys on the staff, at yeah. A-Rod and those guys. What's it been like kind of reestablishing relationships with them and working alongside them? It's been tremendous. It's, it's like thrown in the back to 1998 okay. you know they're, they're the same people that they were back then from a from a personality standpoint number one but the fact that they're all good people you know they were good people then they're good people now so it's been fun what was the sales pitch to get you back here what they what they what they say it you know honestly being 100 percent honest yeah. there were only a, a handful of college jobs that i would have entertained this being one of them and they didn't really have to sell me on it much okay. you know because i I understand this place. I understand BYU. I understand the culture and, and the integrity of the university and the program itself, and, and how you know ravenous the fans are. I mean, it's it's a great place. It really is. So, and then to be able to work with these guys, that's that was what drew me back here. Last thing for me, some people have compared Kalani to Lavelle, and obviously you played for Lavelle for the time you were here. Would you say that's in a fair comparison? I don't think I've been around him as a head coach enough yet, okay. to be honest with you. All right. um, but I do know this, he certainly cares for his team and wants to develop them as men and as players, which is great. There you go, Kevin Gilbride, BYU tight ends coach, and you heard him talk about it. He said there are very few programs I would have lost, left Excuse me, the NFL ranks for, and BYU is one of them. I think he mentioned it, all of his connections to Kalani Satake, Aaron Roderick, uh, on down the list of the guys he played with during his short time at BYU and just having gotten to know them over the years uh, in terms of his coaching career. Uh, this was an absolute home run hire. I don't, I'm not unabashed in saying that. I've got nothing against Steve Clark, but let's be real. The BYU tight ends position, it had a stagnated in terms of the overall development of BYU's uh, position group in that unit, and they needed to get more out of the guys there. I'm talking about the four-star talents like a Jackson Bowers. Obviously, Reiner Swanson's been shining so far in spring. He talked a lot about what Reiner's brought to the table uh, as a true freshman. And his job, speaking of Coach Gilbride, is to get the most out of each one of these guys. Kalani Satake, talking with us last Friday, talked about the fact that he wanted to get more out of the tight ends. He wants guys who may be more of the the blocking types. We're thinking like the fullback types, like Mason Fakahua. He wants them to be more receiving options, uh, whereas maybe a pass catcher, a pure pass catcher like Keanu Hill, he's got to prove capable of being a guy who can block in line for BYU at the tight end position. Because uh, as Kalani pointed out, if you go back and listen to that interview, he talked about the fact that sometimes when you put per- certain personnel on the field, it dictates to the defense. They know that if a guy like Mason Fakahua in the past was on the field, well, he's out there to block. He's not going out to catch pass is traditionally, and they need to have more versatility from BYU's tight ends. And Kevin Gilbride, having done what he's done in the NFL, working with a lot of very, very good tight ends during his uh, career at the professional ranks, he knows what it takes, A, to be effective at that position, speaking of the tight ends, but B, also to develop these guys where they can become options to go and play in the professional ranks down the road as well. I think Keanu Hill is poised to have a major major role in BYU's offense, especially playing this tight end position. He looks uh, none the uh, slower for the 40-ish pounds he's put on uh, when we've seen him out there at practice, but he is obviously going to be looking to make the most of his one-year transition to tight end, whereas a guy like Reiner Swanson, he's got one year before before he goes on a, mi- goes on a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. How much can he offer to BYU in that year before he embarks on his mission service? TBD, but Kevin Gilbride, his whole focus, his whole job is to make sure that those guys are up to speed and they are in sync 
A, with the offensive line, B, with their quarterback, and obviously uh, being in sync as well in the blocking uh, uh, blocking patterns or blocking pa- plans, I should say, in terms of the overall game plan with BYU's running backs. you got to have everybody working in concert with one another. All 11 guys have a role to play, and far too often last year, different positions, and the tight ends were a big part of it at points, uh, were failing in their uh, assignments as position players. you got to have them be better at that. I think that Kevin Gilbride, just uh, everything I'm hearing slash what we learned today, today uh, about him I think it indicates that he understands what he is uh, trying to get done and obviously uh, he will do his absolute darndest to make sure these guys are ready to roll all right we will wrap up today's edition of the podcast flipping over to BYU basketball for a moment I believe we have the first a uh, true uh I'm target, I guess I should say, for Mark Pope and the BYU basketball program in the transfer portal. And it's a familiar name to any of you who tracked recruiting last year. We'll talk about that next right here on Locked on Cougars. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at Nissan. This week's March Madness Bracket Highlights brought to you by our friends over at Nissan. And each week we're picking uh, teams that stand out to us. A team that has pushed it further than any of the rest, just like all any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs. These teams are able to take it to the next level. Let's talk about our friends with the NC State Wolfpack. What an incredible run this team is on. A team that BYU beat this season, but they have made their way to the Sweet 16. They are this week's Nissan Rogue. The team absolutely surprised all of us with a powerful, powerful performance in their first two games of the NC NCAA tournament wins over Texas Tech and Oakland have set them up to play Marquette in the Sweet 16. They say to win life, go rogue, and that's exactly what the Golden Grizzlies, uh, excuse me, not the Golden Grizzlies, not the Golden Grizzlies, they are uh, the NC State Wolfpack. Wow, I, I read that wrong, apologies, uh, but they are exactly what the NC State Wolfpack have done here. So, I encourage you guys if you're looking uh, to get out and do something different, you're looking for a new adventure, you want to have a new ride around town, no matter what you're looking for. Do it with our friends over at Nissan. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or the Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. It's all courtesy of your friends over at Nissan. And, of course, you can shop them at NissanUSA.com. Once again, that's shop NissanUSA.com. Today's show is also brought to you by our friends over at Utah Community Credit Union. Good news is UCCU has elevated their checking accounts by enhancing them with more benefits, more savings, and more online protections than ever before. A lot more, my friends. Paired with the most advanced and comprehensive mobile banking tools, elevated checking is a must-have financial product packed with lifestyle, security, and financial benefits for you, the consumer. The lifestyle benefits include cell phone protection, roadside assistance, telehealth, with 24-7 access to licensed health uh, health professionals with zero copay, uh, more importantly. Importantly, and exclusive savings on travel, shopping, and dining. Think about that. It's an incredible list of benefits, and it goes on and on and on. I could spend an hour here telling you about all of it, but the best part is elevated checking is free when you do any one of the following. Use your credit or debit card 15 times or more a month, have a $500 or more uh, direct deposit monthly, or maintain an average daily balance of $1,500 in your account. Otherwise, UCCU and their elevated checking is just $6 a month to take advantage of all of these features. So visit uccu.com to open an elevated checking account online today or stop by any branch in person to open that account right away, my friends. It's all courtesy of your friends over at UCCU. Love where you bank. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. would encourage you guys, if you have not done so already, please consider subscribing to our Locked On Cougars Insider Group. It's a 14-day free trial. It is a great way to interact with the show, literally getting text messages from me when I'm out on the practice field. Uh, for example, this afternoon, I'll be out there as BYU participates in their uh, third-to-last practice of a spring ball. They have this uh, today, Tuesday, Thursday, and then Saturday will be the final day of BYU spring ball. If you want my updates as I'm sending out there during media observation, and come directly to your phone via text message. You got to be a part of our Locked On Cougars Insider Group. You can get the links in the show notes below. 14-day free trial to see if it's the right option for you to interact with the show and myself. And then it's just $5 a month afterwards if you want to roll with us. And we're having a really, really fun time. Uh, we're nearing, I believe, 75 subscribers. I've got goals uh, before the season gets here to up that to at least 100, if not more, subscribers. So if you'd like to be a part of it, I would love for you guys to be a part of it and just to have a new way to interact with the show and also support us along the way as well. All all right, so BYU basketball uh, has turned their attention fully uh, to the transfer portal period. Now, uh, it's disappointing, obviously, because you'd like to have seen BYU go on a little bit of a run in March Madness. But alas, now they have to look to the future. And a familiar name has popped up back in the transfer portal, and that is the name of Keanu Dawes, a, a, a freshman who spent last year with the Rice Owls, was an all-American uh, athletic conference a freshman team honoree, actually a unanimous selection amongst the uh, selectors, I believe it's the coaches at the AAC who make those 
those selections. Uh, had a pretty solid uh, freshman campaign. Nothing super spectacular, honestly, but he did average just north of six points per game. Also averaged 4.1 rebounds, uh, six foot nine, 215 pounds. And he was a guy that uh, his final three schools uh, coming out of high school essentially were Utah. BYU and Rice. He grew up in Houston, so he opted to play home, uh, play close to home with the Owls, but then the Owls fired their head coach. They just recently hired the new SMU, uh, the former SMU coach uh, to take over there with Rice. We'll see if that uh, plays any role. Maybe Keanu Dawes uh, removing his name from the transfer portal, but I believe the BYU absolutely should look at Keanu Dawes for one reason and one reason only. You have Fuseni Traore, you have Ali Khalifa, who are kind of your front uh, uh, court pairing. They're going to be the lead guys next year for BYU, but both of them just have one year of eligibility remaining. So you need to plan for the future. Keanu Dawes, his shooting numbers aren't going to make you go, wow, we need to get this guy in this program right away. But you don't need to have guys who are obviously going to uh, light it up on the scoreboard from outside. Keanu Dawes, a uh, big thing is he is more of a traditional four man. Think of Fuseni Traore, albeit with a six foot nine frame. Fus is six five conservatively, uh, is built like an uh, just a, a barrel of a human being with that broad chest. Keanu Dawes is not necessarily that, but he plays more of the tr traditional four man role that I think BYU could benefit from having a guy like that in the program. Like I said, his numbers aren't going to uh, blow you away from what he did as a freshman, but the AAC coaches, the Athletic Amer the American Athletic Conference, excuse me, their coaches saw enough in this young man to think that he was an all-freshman honoree and he was one of just two unanimous selections to that team. So you'd be taking him more, uh, once again, on upside in terms of what you believe you can get out of him if BYU were able to land him in the transfer portal. But I believe that BYU will have interest in Keanu Dawes once again, a, a year removed from ultimately losing out uh, on his services uh, due to him picking uh, Rice. But the other thing is, he is still the nephew of Derek Dawes, the former BYU big man. So he has the family connection to the BYU basketball program as well. So uh, keep an eye on this. It's one to pay attention to. There are going to be plenty of other names that pop up uh, here in the transfer portal period. But I believe that uh, Keanu Dawes is absolutely a guy you should have on your short list of guys BYU will be contacting and I think likely will be in the running for if things go according to plan here in terms of uh, portal targets BYU may be chasing. So there you go. That's what I got for you guys on this Tuesday edition of the podcast podcast. Cannot thank you guys enough for your support of the podcast. As always, hope you're doing well out there. Like I said, I'll be out at BYU football practice later on this afternoon. If you want those updates, join the Locked On Cougars Insider Group. And of course, uh, regardless, thank you for your support of Locked On Cougars, making it your first listen of the day. And obviously uh, being everydayers with us right here on the Locked On Podcast Network, where as we always say, it is your team every day right here on Locked On Cougars.